Hello, I'm Bonnie Langford, and this is The Sirens of Audio. G'day audiophiles, this is the Sirens of Audio, the show that explores the universe of Doctor Who in the audio medium. My name's Dwayne. And my name is Philip. G'day Dwayne, g'day audiophiles. G'day Philip. Now it's a very exciting time of the month, Philip. You know what time of the month it is? No, what time of the month is it, Dwayne? It is time for... We've got Randomoids. <coughs> That's right, it's Randomoids again and we've had a couple of stories selected by us in random by the Big Finish Randomoid Selectatron. Those stories are both Sixth Doctor and Perry stories. Uh, Ish was one of them, uh, one of the early Colin Baker stories. And the other one is a lost story, Guardians of Prophecy. So we're going to talk about both of those in today's episode. And as a little bonus feature, we're going to have one of the writers of Guardians of Prophecy, the adapter, Johnny Morris is going to be joining us to uh, to talk a little bit about that, a little bit about the process behind that, originally based on an idea by Johnny Byrne. Mm, yeah, so very good. looking forward to that. So normally we go straight into our rabbit hole topic, but I'm going to incorporate it into the review of it for our first story, which is going to be Ish. Is that okay with you, Philip? I guess so. So we don't have to fall in just yet. Okay. Uh, So what I'll do before I throw in a trailer for Ish, I'll just read the blurb. Now, Ish is number 35 in the monthly range. So it's a a very, very old story. Uh, If you haven't heard it, you can purchase it very cheap directly from Big Finish as a download, or you can hear it for free on Spotify. But here's what it's about. A conference of lexicographers, bromides in tweed, but the leading expert in the field is found dead by her own hand and by her hologlyphic assistant. Is he responsible? Does the death fit any conventional definitions? Can the doctor deduce who wrote the the suicide note and why exactly was it riddled with spelling errors? Perry should help out, but there's a guy, someone who loves language even more than the doctor. Maybe she realises enough to kill for, or perhaps just enough to ask her out to dinner. Unless, of course... He's already spoken for. Is it madness? Seeking transcendence in the complete lexicon? Having the right words on the tip of your tongue, but never quite knowing when to use them? If so, how? Ish. Doctor Who. Ish. New entry. Ish. Hey, this isn't bad. Do we take a wrong turn and end up somewhere interesting? Interesting? A convocation of linguists, lexicologists, and logomaniacs? I keep coming back to the same thing. No. Words have to be out there, in use, meaningful. Words are meant to be spoken. Yeah, but more than that. I reckon words are meant to speak through us. <laughs> Handy after a few drinks. <laughs> or even speak us into existence. Book. The lexicon? Book is its intelligence. An artificial intelligence. What What other other kind kind is there? (laughs) If Osifer didn't write the note, if she died by a hand other than her own, then her killer remains at large. And, I'm willing to bet, still on campus. Book. I'm sorry. We weren't thinking. Weren't thinking. What are you doing in here? Why did you interfere with my work? What makes you think you will get out of here alive? When? When will violent death ever make sense? Would you please sign my dictionary? 
So, Philip, this is a story that I was very excited about going back to, but I want to get your initial thoughts on going back for a re-listen to this one. Well, it's interesting. Both the ones we look at today, I haven't listened to for years. Um, and in fact, that is the prophecy I've only heard listened to once before when I first got it. I hadn't listened to it since then at all. Ish, I've probably listened to one or two other times early on, but it's been a lot of years since I listened to this. So yeah, I was, I, I was really looking forward to going back and hearing them both. Uh, my memories of Ish was I really liked it at the time. It was something that I thought could really only be done on audio. So I think thought it was you know, the sort of story that needed audio to work. Um, I'm not quite so sure, actually, this time. I know Whispers of Terror needed, was really, could only be done on audio, and I thought Ish yes. was the same light. And I, and I put in a similar sort of category as Whispers of Terror, but that being said, it's been a while since I've heard Whispers of Terror, so, so, so I might be wrong there. Is that because um, it's experimental and trying to exploit the audio medium? That's right. And still, yeah. and both Six Doctor, both Perry. Yep. So I think there are similarities there. I think um, Whispers of Terror was a great success. I think they were playing on that a bit with this. Uh, yeah, so it go, I was looking forward to going back and hearing it again. What, what, what were you looking forward to when you went back, Dwayne? Oh, well, I love, I've always loved the the actor who plays Book. Um, what's his name? It's Moray Treadwell. What a voice he has. It's a very kind of soothing yet creepy voice at the same time. Yeah, the way, the way he talks about the words and talks about Ish and... Um, yeah, I was, I was really looking forward to going back and, and hearing that again. It's an interesting story. It's the only story written by Australian writer Phil Pascoe. And I was looking back through some information. Where was I finding this? I think if you look at the backstage tab on uh, Ish on the Big Finish website, there's a, a big section that was actually written by Kenny Smith that goes in depth into behind the scenes of Ish. And in there, I think Phil talks about uh, approaching Gary Russell at Whovention 2000 uh, and, and pitching this idea to him because at the time they were taking open submissions from anybody. Those were the days, Philip. Those were the days. What was I doing? I should have been uh, born in the wrong time. <laughs> well, I think they've got several thousand more listeners now. And if they actually opened up for everyone, it would go out of, it would go crazy. Yeah, some really good stories would, would slip right by, I'm sure. So, yeah, the idea was pitched to Gary. He thought it was a very interesting idea. And uh, it was commissioned, accepted. But interestingly, I didn't remember that this was directed by Nicholas Briggs. And uh, according to the notes that I see here, uh, Nick says, actually, I'll read it. It's a quote from Nick. He says, Ish was an interesting challenge. We had a lot of fun in the studio because Colin Baker, noting the linguistic nature of the script, brought in his volumes of the concise Oxford English Dictionary. The print was so small, each volume came with its own individual magnifying glass to read it. So that would have been, that would have, sounds like fun. We made use of those magnifying glasses. So Colin and I spent a lot of time in the control room looking up words. We found a few better replacements, but also reaffirmed some of Phil's excellent use of language. Uh, he says, it's true, it's true that I felt, felt it my duty to bolster up the drama a bit with some last minute rewrites. I felt that the very clever, engaging concept behind the story also needed some dramatic build up, especially around the episode climaxes, but it all came together rather well. There were some problems in post-production with a new sound designer who was extremely talented, but not quite prepared for the huge weight of the actual workload. It taught me a lesson about auditioning and preparing new sound designers properly. Life is one big learning curve, that's for sure. So that was Nick Briggs talking about that. And interestingly, the sound designer, which is something I really love about this episode, was uh, Neil Clapperson. And this is his only credit. So the experience of doing Ish sounds like it may have even turned him off. I don't know, but he's... Well, it's hard to know whether it broke him or they broke him anyway. <laughs> yeah. um, he did the music too. So, yeah, I mean, I, I thought the sound design of the music was great. But yeah, this is the only one he does either of. And it, it, it well, the music like was it, minimal, so there yeah, wasn't too it, much it, music in It sounds like there. it just didn't work out. It's, yeah, the, the impression that... Actually, it's, it's, it's actually a very interesting backstage thing because it's a bit harsh. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'd, I, I don't think I would be publishing. It's unusual to be quite so 
blatant and honest um, well, on the website. Yeah, well, I've seen, I've yeah, Nick. I, I think Nick uh, calls a spade a spade, um, and I think the point he was trying to make there was that uh, he needs to prepare sound designers for the job, the job ahead. I think that's what he was uh, was yeah. trying to say there. Yeah, but, it, but it's it's also a big critical of the writer too, in terms of you know having to boost up the drama and things. Um, yeah, so it's, it's an interesting production in terms of it's the only time the sound designer, musician, and the writer never came back to be finished. Mm. But I, that money, yeah, probably, it'd be interesting to know. It's supposed to be a bit more in the early days because there's um, some, I guess, fear the fear monger um, also was about us. Oh, lives no. in Australia. Yeah, well, I guess he's Australian now, John Blum. Yep. John Blum, because that's the only one I think he's ever done, I think, for Big Finish. Um, so the, I guess in the it's early only days... only audio. Only audio. He did write a Blake 7. Oh, with of course Kate, he did. With yes, Kate right. Orr. Yep. With Kate. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, there's a, there might be a few more people early on, but it's just one-offs just to see whether they could get the style. And I think, I mean, they were doing so much themselves working out what worked, what didn't work. Um, early on, I think, you know, I think Gary's admitted when he talked to us that they didn't know how long a script should be. Now, now they you know, now they know exactly how many words it should be, da da da, because they, they, they've worked out how they how they do it. But early days, it's a bit like the first season, I think, when Chris Eccleston was Doctor, they had no idea how to make Doctor Who. And everything overran, everything was a disaster that first year, and everything was just high stress. I think early days of Big Finish were in some ways similar, just working out who could do sound design, who could do music. Who could write in the right way uh, without major rewrites needing to be done? Yeah. And they were doing quite experimental stuff all the way through that first 50. And this is uh, this is one example of that experimental style that they were that they were doing, going wh- right back to, like you said, Whispers of Terror. That was an experimental story. Probably the first major experimental story that I would put in that class at any rate. And uh, Nick, Nick was behind directing a lot of those experimentals. One of the other ones I really enjoy is Creatures of Beauty. Um, Which Nick wrote. Very, he wrote and directed that one too. So, um, yeah, the concept of, of a creature living in language was something that was brand new for the time, but also the new series. It made me think of the new series because you remember the Shakespeare Code? Yes. That was all, that was all about words. So a similar kind of theme behind that but obviously the story was executed to be a lot less um, um, high concept a bit more alien-esque a bit more easy to understand and that's the thing I wanted to talk to you about was that I think you've got to be with some big finish or maybe lots of big finish you've got to be in the right frame of mind to be able to take some of these stories in and uh, perhaps when I re-listened to this, I wasn't quite in the right frame of mind because I, I knew when I finished listening to it that there was so much more in there that I'd missed. Um, and I, I get the basic concepts behind-ish, but yeah, I know that I, I could have been concentrating a lot harder than I should have been. Um, but I think the fact that I had to and I wasn't in the right mood at the time to do it sort of detracted from the story a little bit for me. Yeah, I, I I do feel this is well. Firstly, it feels like a new writer's early script because it feels like he might be trying just a bit too hard. But it's it's certainly it's, it's not a script for children, but not because of violence or anything like that. It's because it is actually so difficult. So the concepts in it, the language is so highbrow. Mm. Um, it's it's very very clever. There's there's particular scenes. There's a wonderful scene with Perry and I forget who she's with. Um, with all these ish words where they were being beeped out. Yes. And I, I didn't realise there were so many words in the English language that had ish in it. <laughs> and it's, it's a very clever scene with you know, every ish being beeped. Yeah. Um, but it's just, there's a lot of, it, it, it's very much a script for Colin. Colin loves language. He loves playing with words. He loves the longer the words, the better. And he was in his element. But you really had to focus because it's clever. It's a very clever script. And I think I said to you beforehand, I think it's trying to be just a bit too clever. So there's, there's, there's a real danger when you're trying a bit too hard. And I think there's, there's moments in which it's just trying just a bit too hard to be clever. But it is certainly engaging. It's got lots of very clever ideas. Um, having a word monster um, is, is clever. There is peril there. 
Um, it's a bit weird having a dead person being one of the major characters, sort of resurrected in a bizarre way. But it's, yeah, it's interesting. And there is a mystery there that has to be solved. So it's not, it, it did kind of get to the end of the third episode. And I thought, what's left? It was, it's one of those, there's been a couple of shows I've listened to recently where it kind of feels like, you know, you've done everything you need to do in three episodes. And I know one of the things that um, Nick did when he came on board was actually start doing a lot of three episode with one episode shows because mm. he was feeling actually that three episodes was actually the right length for Doctor Who. Often with four episodes, you're just putting just a bit too much padding. And I think there's there's a f- bit of a feeling in this one that may have been just a bit too much padding going on. Um, yeah, and actually, I thought similarly a bit with Guardians of Prophecy. There's a bit of padding in there that, you know, if you, yeah, both both of them would work really well in a 45, 50 minute format. Now, I can see what they cut out, but yeah, it's, it's certainly enjoyable. Yeah, really enjoyable to go back to. It's it's still a story that I have very fond feelings for because of particularly the sound design and the character of Book. Moray Treadwell has appeared a couple of other times in Big Sarah Finish Jane. Stories. Sarah, Sarah Jane, Jane and more recently, Transference in that one too. He had a, a, a few roles in Transference. So uh, I thought that was interesting. I will call out Clayton, it's quite Clayton Hickman's cover, which is just beautiful. And I still remember getting the CD and just opening up the CD and thinking, what a gorgeous, gorgeous cover. Those early covers are amazing, aren't they? Yeah. Really, really good stuff. So, uh, yeah. I can't. I, good call out. Good call out. All right. So that was our first pick um, for uh, the Randomoid Selectatron. Uh, and the second pick that the Selectatron picked for us was Guardians of Prophecy, another Six Doctor story, but from the missing season 23, or was it, or was it just an idea? Originally written by Johnny Byrne, and I'll read the blurb once again, and then we'll go into a trailer for it. It says, The TARDIS materialises on Serenity, the last surviving world of the Trakan Union. Perry expects a good place for a holiday, not Tomb Raiders, a labyrinth filled with terrifying monsters, and a trap-laden necropolis. For Serenity's gentle name belies its history as the home planet of the Melkur, soldiers created to serve a long, dead, dark force, the embodiment of evil itself. While they sleep, vicious thieves are after this force's secrets and will stop at nothing to find them. But will they find more than they bargained for? Coming soon from Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, The Lost Stories. The Guardians of Prophecy. The elect of Serenity are now in session. In reverence and tribute to the benign union. And in praise of the all-powerful prophecy. Don't let the name take you in, Perry. It's pure overcompensation. Serenity is neither serene nor benign. I am Commander Mura of the Palace Guard. Ah. And it's my duty to inform you, Doctor, that you're under arrest. Our ship was forced down to this planet by one of those statue things, uh, d- the Melker. Open the labyrinth. Please, sir. I beg you. The creatures in there, they'll, they'll eat me alive. Guards, throw him in. The Melker are evil. The doctor told me. And they're only dormant because they need the presence of evil to come alive. Melker, you will advance to the palace of the elect. You are to tolerate no resistance. Anyone who attempts to stop you is to be destroyed. Understand? We understand. Then go, my bringers of darkness. I, Malador, the new guardian of serenity, will see that they pay for the crimes of their ancestors. Subscribers get more at bigfinish.com. Okay, so Philip, when the Randomoid Selectatron picked out this story and I said it was a lost story, I could almost see your eyes roll. I think the lost stories have an interesting place in, in the canon. Often there's a, there's a good reason why they're lost. <laughs> and, I, and I think, you know, we have to be very cautious about why we want to bring back some of these stories. The fact that someone, you know, wrote a draft and submitted it I don't think qualifies it necessarily to say this is worth doing again. And certainly, as we listen to a number of the lost stories, I do think a number of them 
there was a good reason <laughs> why it was lost. It should remain lost. And so, yeah, that, that was still my opinion. And uh, a lot of this season, um, I wasn't that impressed by. And in my head, Guardians was actually in that category. So I, I'd only, I only listened to it once. I listened to all the lost stories quickly through. Um, I was most interested in the Sylvester McCoy lost season that they did. Yeah. Um, because that, that to me felt like it really would have been real. Yes. Um, but that being said, I mean, I, I loved hearing Return of the Cybermen a couple months back, and I'm looking forward to the, the arc, and I'm not quite so sure about the Genesis of the Daleks, but from what we hear, it's only one episode anyway. It, it's interesting, it's, it's a curiosity about what they've did, done, and if if you just sit that way, it's, it's worthwhile. But this was why I was thinking, well, I'm, I'm not sure. But I will say, I was really surprised by how much I enjoyed this. Me too. And it's, it's it's made me think I need to go back to this again. You enjoyed it too, Dwayne? Oh, absolutely. It it blew me away. You you listened to it before me, and the first thing you said to me was, "I really enjoyed the '80s uh, music." I think it's Steve Foxen, is it that does? Uh, yeah, it is. Does the music on this? So yeah, always reliable as a uh, sound designer and, and musician. And they've they've really got they've really got this down pat. It is a sequel to. The Keeper of Traken, but it's yeah, it's a sequel because it's set in the future, the last surviving planet of the Traken Union after the events of Logopolis, and um, it's hundreds of years in the future, so it's it's yeah. kind of been forgotten and it, it's alluded to, and the Doctor sort of alludes to it, and Perry says, "Oh, what are you talking about?" And it's a, uh, I'll tell you later, which is interesting that they didn't allude more, but it, it is yeah, it, it feels like Traken. Yeah, it's it's interesting the way that it's set up that it's still got a group of like counselors who are sort of surrounding this computer, a bit like the source in Keeper of Truck. And although you had a human in the middle of that in the, in the Keeper of Truck, and this is just basically a computer. Uh, so interesting the way, so, so with that in mind, I could sort of imagine that it was a similar kind of world to Truck. so I had those similar visuals going through my head while I was listening to it. Well, the King of Triken used to look after all the different planets of the Triken Union, didn't he? Didn't he travel from planet to planet? Did he? I, th- I thought I thought he was part I, of the Perhaps whole... he did. Perhaps he did, yeah. So so I think this I think the reason why they had to move to the computer was once the, the Keeper was dead with the events of um, the Keeper of Triken and then wiped, the planet wiped out in Logopolis, yeah. they, they needed a substitute and they used a computer to, to fulfil his function. So, yeah, I think the counsellors, who are now guardians, uh, they were fulfilling the same role as what the, what the counsellors were and the keeper was in the keeper, the keeper of Triton. Yeah. So, some interesting guest cast in there. Uh, Simon William, Williams as, uh, as, as a guardian. What, what the heck was he doing with that accent? Could you work out what he was doing? <laughs> That was the weirdest <laughs> accent I've ever heard. It was like, was it Welsh? Was it? Is uh... that funny that you say that? Because I mean, I adore, I adore Simon Williams. Oh yeah, he's yeah. Great. great. Ever since, ever since upstairs, downstairs, and then with you know, Revelation of the Daleks, and I, you know, I adore the whole um, countermeasures countermeasures series. I, I think Simon is just amazing, but I had no idea what he was doing with that accent because he kept changing. Yeah, I, yeah I, it was, I thought it was Welsh and then it wasn't. And that had me thinking about the accent rather than the story all the way through. Well, I I thought, it, was, it was bizarre. It's, uh, it's not that I disliked it, but it just had me confused, to put it that way. <laughs> no, it was, it, kept, it changed. I didn't know it was him. And I wasn't sure whether he was trying to play more than one character. Right. In, put by putting on different accents because I couldn't tell it was the same character regularly. Yeah. Because the, the accent kept changing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it, I'm usually, glad it I mean, wasn't just me. No, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that because that that was the one thing that I was going to say. Usually, so reliable, and dependable. Um, yeah, and, and obviously, yeah, obviously the director. I don't just don't remember who it is. Ken Bentley's. I mean, Ken Ken let it slide, so he was obviously happy. I, I do kind of wonder maybe in the studio it wasn't as bad, but it was because it was a mixed. Because all, all the scenes with him was tended to be mixed with all the other Guardians and they were all talking on top of each other. It would have been okay if there was other people with similar accents. Accents. But he was the only one. I could never... Yeah. Whether he was trying to disguise his RP voice or... I have no idea. Like, 
<laughs> well, if we get Simon on, um, we actually won't ask him. <laughs> <laughs> Probably what wouldn't remember. You, what were you trying to do with that accent? But aside from Simon Williams, who thought it wasn't a big role, to be honest, it really was quite a minor role. And it doesn't. It it really doesn't detract from the story at all. Uh, no, I think I think because the part's so minor, <laughs> it, yeah. it didn't do this. Yeah, I mean, I mean the, the standout performance for me uh, is Graham Cole. Um, I, I'm a huge fan of the Bill, and of course, yeah, Graham Cole was a regular on the Bill for more than ten years. Um, and he was some, you know, fun. He's just a nice guy on, on the Bill, and he was a Doctor Who monster. Cause he played Melker in the original Keeper of Traken. He was Cyberman in in Earthshock. Uh, he was often rubber suits. I think he did. I don't know how many Doctor Who shows did he? But he did quite a few in the eighties. Wasn't he but, fabulous in this? He was just so three dimensional, amazing, oh, and just adorable. He, he was kind of the, a Villa character. Yeah, and I was thinking, yeah, Villa glitz. Yeah, lovable rogue, fun yeah, to yeah. be around. Yeah. Um, I mean, I loved his anecdotes. He'd go off on a story. I, I think they may have pushed that just one time too many in terms of, yeah, not, not another story. But in terms of just a, this jovial character he just liked all the time, once again, only only show that Graham Cole's ever done, he's never come back for anything else. Right. Uh, and I think they brought him back because of the whole Melker connection. He did also play Melker, but Melker has so few lines, it was irrelevant. But yeah, he was a brilliant character. And of course, the other character who stood out for me, actor who stood out for me, was Stephen Thorne, um, Mr. Melador. Um, you know, he's um, famous for Omega. Or... He, he sound, sounds the same in everything he does, but you just don't care. Yeah, exactly. I mean, <laughs> what what a voice. It's just it, the most amazing bad voice that you could possibly have. Just eeks evil, doesn't it? It's just so good. Cause he play, he, did he play Satan in the new series? Was that Stephen Thorne? Ah uh, yes, he did. He what? Uh, no, 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 no. That was Gabriel Wolf. Gabriel Wolf. Okay, yeah, yeah. They're, they're both in very similar sort of leagues in my thinking in terms of those voices because they're just yeah, so so good. Yeah. What, what, what so, so, so he was he was uh, in three Doctor Who stories, wasn't he? Uh, on TV, he was so, the Demons so and three Doctors. Demons, three Doctors, Hand of Fear. Hand yeah. of Fear played Eldred. He did. So well, one of them. Uh, but he also played in the Ghost of End Space. So if you like that voice, you you go back to the old uh, Third Doctor audio story, um, the last one that John Pertwee did, Ghost of End Space. There you go. Which we will talk about at some stage, but yes, definitely. We won't we won't be praising it too much. <laughs> oh, I, I don't know. Well, Actually, we'll see. Once we'll see. It's, you go it's back and you go. Been oh. fifteen years, twenty years since I've listened to it, so maybe my views have changed. Yep. Yeah, the time, I think I, I listened to bits of it. I w- I've got it on cassette, so I was transferring it from cassette onto my uh, computer, onto MP3, and I was listening to bits of it then, and I went, hmm, I, d- I don't think I listened to all of it. But uh, anyway, that's another story altogether. But yeah, this is a this is a great lost story. Um, fantastic. Uh, everyone usually likes The Keeper of Truck, and it's one of uh, season 18's best stories. And uh, I think it's a worthy sequel, and I can see that it would have been uh, would have been a pretty grotesque imagery, in, in particularly when uh, Malador's being brought back to life towards the end. There, uh, that would have been interesting to see translated onto the screen. But obviously, it can be a bit more grotesque on audio than you can on screen. So, uh, yeah, I think this is a really, really good addition to the Lost Stories range. Yeah, and once again, the regulars, Colin, Colin Baker and Nicola Bryant, are just superb. And once again, I think how Jonathan Morris has split them up really well and sensibly, and who they get to play with while they're apart, it just, yeah, it, everything's played together really well. And their relationship with each other was actually a nice relationship too. So it's interesting that, yeah, we talk about Big Finish as the ones who fix up their relationship. Um, it's nice that, yeah, um, Johnny Morris is, yeah, I mean, I don't know how John Lee Burns would have written it, whether he would have written them all Nike with each other or not. But certainly um, by the time Jonathan Burns, um, Johnny Morrison comes along, he's made the relationship much nicer and civil. So they actually do seem to care for each other. I think in the extras there, there's a, there's a reference made to the fact that this is set post-Mysterious Planet. Uh, that's where they decided to, to go with it. So uh, the relationship was mellowing a lot in Mysterious Planet. In fact, I think that's, as far as the re- TV relationship between the Sixth Doctor and Perry goes, I think that's my favourite. That's that's what I would have liked to have seen the whole time, actually. Uh, I'm curious to know why it wasn't made. 
Because yeah. to me, this has everything that should have been made. It's got a returning monster. It's got strong roles for other people. It's got you know a nice monster. I mean, I don't think it would be too expensive. I mean, I don't Mate, know how it many was pretty big it. there with all those milkers coming to life and. Yeah, well, you just had to make three, wouldn't you? And just keep shooting at a different angles. <laughs> yeah, that's right, I guess. <laughs> they, they you can do it with than... Daleks, you can do it with Melkers. Yeah, they didn't even more than six of anything, did they? In any monster show, you just, how you film. Yeah, yeah. And so it's basically the first time we get to see the Melkers as they really are, because obviously in the Keeper of Traken, it's a TARDIS uh, that it turns out to be. So, yeah, interesting backstory for the Melker as well. So, uh, yeah, highly... I, I highly recommend this one, actually. Yes, so do I. It's really good. All right. Let's have a chat with writer Johnny Morris about The Guardian's Prophecy. Okay, so we're we're here discussing uh, The Guardians of Prophecy, which is one of the lost stories uh, from... Uh, was it supposed to be originally season... The original season 23, but based on a Johnny Byrne script. And we've got the, the writer who adapted that with us, Johnny Morris. Hi, Johnny. Oh, yeah. Good to speak to you. So tell us about this. How did you come to be adapting uh, this particular story? Uh, well, I think David Richardson probably was the guy who approached me. Um, and I'm not sure why he chose me, I, why he thought I'd be a good fit. Maybe it's just because I was called Johnny and he thought that was that would match. Um, the two Johnnies. Yeah. and I was, But I was given this brief of, because it was a story that Johnny Byrne submitted to the production office around 1985-ish. But it doesn't, I think, I don't think it appears in any sort of internal development sort of production paperwork. So like a lot of these things, it might have been sent in and Eric Sayward might have just put it to one side. And so it's not the side, it was sent in. Was it even read? Was It wasn't rejected? We don't know. Things disappear into black holes. Um, does that always happen, or just under Eric? Uh, oh, I think it's just. Te- I think it's television in general. Okay. You no, know, I mean, because I've I've submitted scripts that people have asked for and chased up, and you send it in, and then you hear nothing back, and it's not because they've um, read it and hate it, which is what you always think as a writer. It's because um, things should they other things happen. You know, they have other they have another project which needs their full attention. And so things get forgotten. It's just how, it's just how these things work sometimes. So it's not just Eric now. So you, the the brief was this um, was to adapt it, and I think at the time, all they had was the synopsis, which had been printed in Doctor Who magazine, which had been sort of worked out with Johnny Burns' uh, input, but had become a bit garbled in the telling. I think it become particularly towards the end. It become a bit. Um, unclear what was going on, certainly in terms of the geography of where things were happening. And it wasn't split up into episodes. It wasn't structured in that way. Um, So I took this synopsis they had and I worked out a storyline, I think in a scene breakdown and uh, started writing episode one. I was about halfway through. And I was in the pub with a friend of mine called um, Sarah Greenwigan. I think I hope I got a pronoun name right. Um, who's a fan who's been around for you know ages, Australian. Yeah, we both was, know Sarah, so uh, you, know, you know Sarah, so you know yeah. I've pronounced her surname incorrectly. Um, and I was I might have been mentioning this, and she's going, "Oh, I knew Johnny Byrne. He sent me this really this synopsis of this thing called Gardens and Prophecy." And I was going, "What?" She says, "Yeah, I've got a synopsis of the whole thing." And I was going, "Can you just lend it to me?" And so she lent me this, and it was like 30 pages of this whole of the whole story all worked out. Um, well, it was it was it gets less worked out as you go along, but it was very, very detailed. And I was comparing this to what I'd already done, and I was going, it matches. What I what I'd sort of guessed and inferred and sorted out was stuff that he was doing. Um, so I was on the right track, and I was really pleased to see things like. Oh, I think that character should appear in that scene. And I look at his version of it and go, oh, he's done that too. So that was great because firstly, it was a whole lot more information, a whole lot of stuff about the story that had never been published anywhere and was really interesting and, but also, and was solving a lot of my problems. 
but also it was just lovely to see I was on the right track. We were, I was, I was doing what he was doing. And so that made writing the rest of it a hell of a lot easier. Were you a, a fan of the, the obvious prequel to this story, Keeper of Truck and yourself? And were you drawing a lot on that? Um, I sort of, I, don't, I blow hot and cold. Sometimes I, watch, well, sometimes I watch it and love it. And sometimes I watch it and go, this is so boring. Um, <laughs> I think I love the story and I love the script. Uh, I mean, I think I'm, Terence Dix did a novelization of it, I think, which is where I probably would have experienced it the most times. I think I read that book quite a lot. And I think um, it has great things going for it. It has a great world that he creates of Tarkin. And, um, you know, it has great sort of, uh, some lovely sort of Shakespearean lines. But then if you watch it and you go, hang on, the master's plan is to sit in, sit in a garden for 20 years <laughs> inside a statue. That, that, that is the stupidest plan, you know. Um, and no one mentions, your, your, your plan is just to stuck it. He, he's not got accidentally stuck there. It's not, you know, he is deliberately doing a plan which involves him doing nothing for a couple of decades. So sometimes I watch and I go, I can't believe no one spotted that. You've talked before that part of your writing is that you like characters to have strong motivations and you start with the motivation for a character and then you let the story unfold from the motiva- motivation. What's it like when you're handed a script like this? Did did the characters have motivations? Did you have to find them? Or does it make it actually a lot harder because you didn't didn't start with the first process? Um, you, you read it and you can infer, you can sort of reverse engineer it. You, so there was a sort of a, a scribe in that story, I think. Uh, and you find out that he's sort of uh, working for this cult that's trying to bring back the the the, the villain or whatever. And uh, I can't remember the names of anything. Malador. Is the... Malador, that's it. Yes, Malador. Um, so you go, okay, so why is, he, why is he trying to bring back Malador? And why did he get fired or whatever? So lots of the characters had these sort of clear motivations from what they do. In the outline, uh, Johnny Byrne had, in, had included a lot of other members of the, um, the sort of the uh, high council of the planet who would get mentioned once or twice and then have nothing else to do in the story. And so all of those, I, I just went, they're not in it. <laughs> but if, if I can take them out of the story, if I can take anyone out of the story and not affect it, take them out because they're not doing anything. Um, I mean, with the Lost Stories, we were allowed a much larger cast than we would normally have for these things. So there's a bit of a bit of a larger budget because obviously on TV they would have had larger casts. I think most of them were pretty strong characters because you had the sort of the safe cracker guy who I had lots of fun writing. I thought he was great fun because obviously I was working from a synopsis. So I had to like write dialogue all me basically. So I'd pull bits of dialogue out of the synopsis. Whenever Johnny Byrne had used an interesting phrase, I'd put that in the script somewhere to make it more of him. But a lot of it was trying to keep the ball, um, trying to expand on what he'd done, because I think in his synopsis, Malador is just this sort of evil force. And so in episode three of The Guardians of Prophecy, I expand quite a lot in Malador's sort of motivation, as it were. This idea that he's surgically re-engineered his brain so that he doesn't have a conscience because he wanted absolute sort of absolute mental freedom. That was that sort of like hinted at in the story where he just goes, he's amoral, he's not evil. And I was just expanding that and trying to make that much more interesting and uh, to um, give the, they give that villain some sort of motivation as well because... In the in the outline, he was very sort of sketched in. Do you feel a sense of um, pressure when you're adapting something, or is it more of a relief because you've already got those characters there and you don't have to think so much from scratch? Um, well, I've done um, four adaptations now. I did um, the Philip Hinchcliffe um, Valley of. Valley of um, Doom, whatever it was, <laughs> uh, and uh, then then I've done Guardians of Prophecy. Then I did um, Damaged Goods, 
And then I've just done Doctor Who in the Ark by John Lucarotti. And they're all sort of like slightly different projects because Doctor Who in the Ark, I had to basically a full script. So it was just taking a TV script and making it for audio. The Philip Hinchcliffe story was basically a page of outline. So I had to completely work out a whole story. So a huge amount of it was... But he was also me. there for you to consult with if you needed to, I guess. Uh, no, he wasn't for that one. Oh, uh, wasn't he? No, I, I got some feedback saying he liked it. But that was <laughs> it. So he's enjoyed it and thought it was a very good writer. And, but um, uh, I, had, I had, had slightly more feedback than I got from Johnny Byrne, but not much more. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, and But with Damaged Goods, then I did get feedback from Russell for that, and he did work on that a bit. So, so this was sort of in between. I think um, it's, oh, it's a sort of like, I don't know if, you, if karaoke is the right word, but you tr- I was trying to write it with Johnny Byrne's sort of style of writing, but overlaid with Eric Sayward's script editing, sort of overlaid with how people acted then and stuff. So one of my big memories is I was writing this and um, there's a scene where someone is, is thrown into the, the maze of death, the labyrinth, they call it. And I was just going... <laughs> No, not the labyrinth! <laughs> Exclamation mark. <laughs> and I was going, if that was me writing as me, that would be a terrible line. I would, I would just. It's, it's a bit tongue in cheek, but if I'm writing something which would be on television in 1985 alongside Vengeance and Varus and Time Lash and stuff, that is exactly that is exactly how they'd have done the line they'd have gone for, and. Um, there was a lot of that of um, stuff which I wouldn't do now. I think um, in episode one, the doctor doesn't really turn up for twenty minutes. You know, it's well, all, that was, pretty, that was that's pretty very typical, typical. Of Colin. Exactly, and I, I wouldn't do that if I was coming up with the story myself. But because I wanted to be authentic to what Johnny Byrne had done, I kept it like that. Even though I would, I, that's not what I would do. And you know, this, the temptation sometimes is to fix things. You know, to go, well, I can make, I can, I'm a good writer. I can make a better version of this. But that's, people don't want that. They want the authentic experience. You are trying to do, make something which is as close to the original script as possible. But even better, that it's, it's as close to how that script would have appeared on television. So you can get a sort of outline and go, okay, how would that have been, how would that have changed? during script editing, how would it have changed during rehearsal? And you try and include that as well. Um, and yeah, so it's, I don't know if, if pastiche sounds, pastiche sounds a negative word, it sounds like, you're trying to sort of um, homage. recreate. Homage, you're trying to accurately recreate um, that era of Doctor Who. Whereas with other stories, you might be, you know, you're not trying to, um, create this sort of ersatz nostalgia experience that sounds negative i think it's lovely it's much it's really fun so did did john dorney's script editor have much to say change i i'm sure he made a huge and valuable contribution but i can't <laughs> remember what it was um and uh i, I remember i think um the director uh, ken bentley also uh, did a round of notes as well. So, because I remember we had a discussion <laughs> about the, the labyrinth, because Ken was going, you do realise that a labyrinth isn't a maze. A labyrinth is one path, and you, so you can't get lost in a labyrinth. And I was going, yes, I know that. I know that I know the strict dictionary definition of a labyrinth, but um, everyone thinks of a labyrinth as being a maze. You know, think of Theseus getting lost and unwinding the bit of string and stuff. So I was going, it's authentic, it's Doctor Who. Johnny Byrne wanted to call it the labyrinth. That's my little joke, I play my joke. Johnny Byrne wanted to call it. Um, so we're going to keep calling it the labyrinth, even though that might be, that might be factually wrong. With a lot of these lost stories, it's easy to look back and see why it was lost and that it probably shouldn't have been produced. This one came across really well and feels like it could have fitted in brilliantly with Colin and Nicola. 
why do you think this wasn't produced? I'm not sure. I think uh, th- there's always reasons within reasons, you know, the sort of, um, uh, there's the politics of, uh, you know, if if, um, if Johnny Byrne hadn't got his round of drinks in at the BBC party after, you know, why is the deep, he might, that might have been it, you know, you never know. I mean, that's how things things are. Um, or if Eric had thought, oh, why is the deep turned out rubbish, you know, if he had a bad feeling about that, you know, if he'd spent a lot of work going, oh, that needed lots of rewrites and it was, it wasn't very good. That could have reflected on Johnny Byrne. That's, um, that's how, how it was. I think a lot of it was just that it was sent in on spec. You know, there might've been a phone call. There might've been him chatting to JNT at a convention and JNT going, oh yeah, we should do another Keeper of Charcony sort of story. So there might've been some sort of, you know, um, interest, but, because he sent it in without being asked first, Eric would have just gone, oh, this is just slush pile stuff. I am, I'm only interested in the stories that we've commissioned, that we've, that we've initiated. So I think it was probably to do with that. I don't think it ever really got as far as Eric reading it and deciding to reject it on the basis of quality. I mean, he could have done. There's all sorts of, there are things in the story which I had to fix and which aren't clear and which would needed to have been fixed. Um, like I said, there's redundant characters and the, the villain's motivation is a bit unclear and there's not there's hardly anything in the synopsis about part four. There's not really a lot of material there. And, and so I had to sort of create a lot of the drama and the, the um, events for part four out of nothing. So he could have rejected it on those grounds. I don't think so because he knew Johnny Byrne was a, a massively experienced and very, very groovy writer, you know. And I, th- I think Johnny Byrne, he was flatmates with John Lennon for a couple of weeks in the 60s and stuff. He, oh, wow. he, he wrote this book called Groupie and stuff. He was sort of, a, he was very much one of the, color, the beautiful people. And then he sort of went on, you know, to write um, Space 1999 and stuff and he created All Creatures Great and Small and One by One. And um, he's doing, he's a very, very successful writer. So I think the other part of it is Eric going, I don't like working with writers who know the job better than I do. And I think Johnny Byrne was one of those people who would have gone, oh God, he's, he's, he's above me, as it were, so in the pecking order. So that, he might have been slightly annoyed by Johnny Byrne for that reason. Isn't practically everyone better writer than Eric Sowood? <laughs> yeah. Yes, but you can see how he's, he was working with people at sort of his career level, like Peter Grimwade and um, Eric Pringle and stuff, or, you know, former script editors, where they're all sort of at the same level. Whereas Johnny Byrne had come in and he'd been, you know, a showrunner for Jerry Anderson writing this yeah. huge, big budget show. So... I th- and honestly, Johnny Byrne had created All Creatures Great and Small, which was like the biggest hit the BBC had f- for the late 70s. It was a huge, huge show. I know Johnny Byrne would just sort of be very relaxed and groovy and go, rewrite what you like, Eric. I don't care. Be, it's out of my hands now. But um, who knows? Who knows? What, who knows? Ask Eric. That's the question. And, and Eric, will say he has, Eric will say he has no memory of the script. It was never sent in. Um, if he'd seen it, he'd probably have commissioned it, Because, but who knows? Well, one character that appears in the story I just wanted to ask you about, because it's, it had me confused all the way through uh, but, the story. I like, I like to confuse the listener. And that's, well, I don't know if it was you or whether it was the actor, but Simon Williams' uh, oh. character throughout. What was with that funny accent that I could not work out what it was the entire story? Was that part of the script or was that, that just Simon? That, that, that's entirely my fault. <laughs> is it? Um, well, the, the story, what it is, is um, I had this idea that this um, uh, this politician was a sort of a he was a sort of a a left wing tub thumping type. You know, he was he's a very morally upright, very sort of um, uh, you know sort of stalwart of the people because he always supports the people. This one, he's always on the side of the people. So I was going, he's a sort of a Nye Bevan type. And which I thought meant, you know, he's a sort of a great campaigner. He's a great speaker. 
Simon Williams quite rightly looked at them and went, he's Welsh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and so he went, he puts on this Welsh accent. And I remember being at the recording at the Moat Studios, I think Ken was directing it. And the first scene comes up and Simon just comes out with this Welsh accent. And <laughs> the button gets pressed and you go, um, Simon, why are you doing that? <laughs> he goes, because it's like, no, I'm, I'm, giving, I'm doing a Nibevan type. It says Nibevan type in my script. And um, I think it was just a case of, um, we went, oh, let's go with it. Let's go with it. It's interesting. Uh, I, I, my opinion was, you know, <laughs> if this was the BBC TV studio in 1985, <laughs> one of the actors would have done this <laughs> because... <laughs> You just watch something like Time Lash with Paul Darrow doing his bizarre Richard III <laughs> sort of performance. I think I was going, it's even more authentic now that we've got an actor doing something weird. And <laughs> lot, lot, lots, of, lots, of, lots of planets have a whales. Um, so it was, it was an odd thing. Um, and if I could go back, I would press that button in the studio. No, just do it with your normal voice, Simon. Um, <laughs> Any actor doing an accent will come and uh, come and go, and you know, you're, if you're doing a part with an accent, you're doing you're adding another layer of difficult. Of you've got to act and you've got to do the accent at the same time. That's two things you've got to get right, rather than just one. So yeah, there, there's it meant a lot of okay. We have to do another take now because Simon drifted into Irish or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, which 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 was a, which takes up time, it wastes time, and that's one. That's the reason why you you should have said don't do the accent because it just meant all those other times where we had to do another take because of it, we wouldn't have needed to. We could have focused more on the performances. But like I say, I think I think it's um authentic to the era, you know. So um, and it's entirely my fault. Make uh, that's absolutely it's entirely my fault. Um, <laughs> it, it, it happened again. Um, if I just with um, damaged goods, by the way, because I I had this character who was a scientist, and I'd written in a script that he was a he was a West Coast sort of um, psychiatrist, which I'd sort of meant as a sort of Carl Sagan-y sort of voice. He's having a sort of a very calm and American accent, as it were, West Coast sort of you know California accent, and. Um, the guy comes in and he says, first thing is, hello, doctor, how are you today? It's like, <laughs> oh God, no, not West Country, not West Country, West Coast. And at that time we went, okay, it's not West Country. It's an American accent. He goes, oh, can you do an American accent? Well, I'll give it a go. <laughs> and so, so yes, that was, um, that's another lesson of, if you you have to be very clear if you're saying these things in a script, because um, if something can be taken the wrong way, it will be taken the wrong way. So make sure you you say it the right way. Can I say, it's just wonderful. Thank you for coming and talking to us again, because a couple of things that we weren't sure about, weren't comfortable with, you've actually explained really well. And that really, yeah, it, it's always good to know that you should be careful criticising because there's always reasons behind why things happen. And at least understanding why this happened is a really helpful process to go through. So, yeah, Johnny, thanks, thanks so much again for your input and your time. That's all right. I, I, it, and, yeah, to, just to make it clear again, um, I'm, I don't want to criticise Simon Williams or his extremely authentic and consistent Welsh accent. Uh, it was it was entirely... And I don't want to criticise the director or whatever, because he was following the script as well. It was entirely me realising if you say a Nye Bevan character, people will think Wales, they won't think what mad thing I have in my head. So yes, it's lovely to talk about and explain it. And, but also this is the, this is the, um, the grit and the pearl. I mean, the rest of the story is fantastic. So um, you have to, it's good to have a sort of a little thing that doesn't quite work. <laughs> Keeps people interested. And we, we, we said before how much we adore Sun Williams and we think Ken is amazing. <laughs> so we certainly <laughs> haven't goes with him either. It was just the one thing that was there. But in terms of, it's a, it's a marvellous story. I think it would have worked brilliantly on TV. It's a shame it wasn't done. The sound design and the music is wonderful. It just really works well. So, yeah, thank you and congratulations, Jonathan. Another great story.
Thank you, thank you. It's uh, it's 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 weird how I remember these things. That was like I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. So yes, wow, lovely. Hello, I'm Ken Bentley, and you're listening to the Sirens of Audio. Okay, so great, Philip, to uh, to go back and uh, listen to those two stories that were chosen for us, completely at random, uh, after a few clicks, and to also get the thoughts of uh, the writer Johnny Morris. It's uh, uh, good to be able to to get some of his background uh, on the story as well. That's for sure. Okay, we have to choose the next two stories. Uh, for our next instalment of We've Got Randomoids. So let's get the Randomoid Selectatron going and we will pick those out right now. First story, Philip, you're going to be very pleased. It's a companion chronicle. Oh, excellent. It's a good one. And I don't know because I haven't heard it. So So I've got them all, but uh, this is a second Doctor story called The Forbidden Time, which features Annika Wills, Written by David Locke. I don't even recognise the writer. Fraser Hines, okay. Fraser Hines is in it as well, so that one will be great to do. Let's click the button and we'll go again. All right, so the next one that we're going to listen to for uh, We've Got Randomoids is a fifth Doctor story from 2014. This one is uh, by Mark Morris. Oh, okay. Be confused with Johnny Morris. It is Moonflesh. Right. You know what, I don't remember that period at all. <laughs> it's a um, tough period, isn't it? Because, I, I don't know, maybe you and I were on similar paths, but I sort of quickly listened to them once and then put them to the side. And... Yeah, I, I would not have listened to it since then. Yeah. That would be part of a trilogy with Nissa, was it? Yes, it is. Just Nissa? Uh, let me was, see. Was the ticket come back by then? Yes, it's just Nissa. Just Nissa, okay. Yeah. Well, I'm look, well, I'm really looking forward to that because I have not listened to that since 2014. Excellent. And, you know, I, That's I, a I long really time, have, eight years. Eight years, and I really haven't dug into some of those more recent ones. You know, every, uh, yeah, more recent eight years. But you know, there, there's a whole period there where I just haven't listened to them since they came out. Excellent. So if you want to join in too, do, uh, do listen to them before our next Randomoids episode uh, for the month of June. And uh, you can share your thoughts too. Send us an email or, or uh, just contact us on our socials as well, Twitter or Facebook. It'd be great to hear your thoughts. Yeah, anything that you send to us, we'll read out. Excellent. Well, within reason. <laughs> <laughs> or, almost anything you send to almost us. Almost anything you send to us, we'll read out. Okay, let's go to recommendations before we close out the episode. And um, it's Philip, your turn, you know, right? is it my turn? Are you yeah. kidding me? Of course it's not my turn. So, my recommendation, um, I'm going to recommend a podcast, um, not Doctor Who podcast, but it's based on what we've been discussing a bit. We had a very bit of discussion about how political we should be, how argumentative we should be, and I guess a lot of our feelings is the fact that we feel that people don't listen well enough to each other, and that we just move into attack mode. I think it's partly socials have done that. Pardon? I think we just attack each other. <laughs> just joking. <laughs> No, we listening. don't. Yes, we I do. Wasn't listening. No, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Philip. That's I broke okay. your flow there. You did. And so there's an Australian podcast, which has only started recently. It's about 10 episodes in, I think, called Principle of Charity. So Principle of Charity. The principle of charity is to listen to people you disagree with. And so the two podcast hosts who are, I think, at least one of them South African, but it's an Australian podcast. Um, it's actually a friend of mine's the producer, she finds the guests for them. They find different topics to talk about, and they find two people who are diametrically opposed to each other in views, but they put them together so they can actually discuss a topic at length and both get opportunities to put their reasonings and their views, and they listen to each other. And then you can make your conclusions at the end in terms of were you swayed by particular arguments or not, but the principle of charity is just the fact that we're not going to start learning and developing until we shut up and listen to one another and at least hear the arguments. And at the end, of it, you may not change your views at all. But the least we need to do is actually occasionally stop and listen to what the so other side is saying. So it's it's almost like a debate, but it's less adversarial. Yes, it, it, mm. it, totally. And so and so and they're, they're amazing experts they get on. Um, so the one I've just listened to recently is: Do criminals deserve to be punished? 
And so there's one side's actually saying that, um, but both sides are saying the criminal reform system needs to be be revised. But one one side is saying, well, criminals should be punished because they've done they've chosen to do the wrong thing. The other side is saying, well, actually, the reason why they've done the wrong thing is because of society and because of upbringing and because of other fa- factors. And to just punish them for doing the wrong thing assumes that they've got free will. And they didn't have free will because of the way society's made them. So, as I said, I, I entered the whole discussion with a very strong view one way, which people may work out what my view probably was. But it was really interesting to just to hear the other side explain. Leon, oh. the story of the Godfather. You want to make a movie? The greatest movie. <laughs> So about that. What's that? <laughs> I just that, that was the that's the end. in. That was, <laughs> <laughs> I tapped the podcast and started to play. <laughs> my, my apologies, everyone. I bet Dwayne does live in there too, you rotter. <laughs> um, but it made me think about a topic that I hadn't thought about at length, and just to think it through. Um, there's one about is immigration a good thing or a bad thing. And so they've got two people to come in, one who hates immigration, one who thinks it's good for the society. Um, is it okay for storytellers to appropriate stories from, cult- from characters from other cultures? And so, you know, sh- should we should we be allowed to tell stories if the culture, the story we're telling, isn't from our culture? Which is particularly relevant in Australia, and then the whole debate is actually about whether or not white people should be able to tell Aboriginal people's stories. Because if they don't want to tell their stories, are they their stories to tell and we should stay out of them, or is it okay for us to take their stories? And part of it, you know, there's a great movie called Rapid Proof Fence, which was you know, an Aboriginal person's story, but it was you know, t- taken by white people and turned into a movie by white people. Is that appropriate? So, you may have an opinion before, I, so there's 13 topics so far they've discussed, they're very different topics, they get people who are very opposing views but they actually just ask questions, they interview them, and yeah, it, you get an interesting perspective by the end. You may not change your mind, that's okay, they're not tr- trying to make you change your mind, but you'll at least have thought through a topic and you've heard a different point of view. So, I, yeah, in terms of what we've been talking about often, in terms of how you put up with stuff and how you listen to things and listen to people, it just, it's appealed to me. Excellent. What about you, Dwayne? What have you been listening to? What would you like to recommend? Well, I was scrolling through my facebook feed i came across a blake seven uh group that someone had posted uh, a radio play from 1980 written by tanith lee so tanith had written two stories in blake seven one was from season four called sand and i think the other one was season three sarcophagus, sarcophagus. and uh, i thought okay that sounds interesting so i went and had a look and then i discovered that it starred paul darrow playing a character called Paul Baxter, I think. So it was weird hearing everyone call him Paul all the way through it because he plays it exactly like Avon. Uh, and it's a, it's a time travel. Does he kind of play everyone like Avon? <laughs> I mean, I love Paul Darrow. But he... Oh, you can't get enough of his voice anyway. He, no. can't, he does play different characters, as you've seen in, in Doctor Who, but... Um, was that yeah. just kind of Avon as well? Just no. A bit more exaggerated? He's not, he's not Avon in Time Lash. Don't give me that. Um or, or not even the Silurians. It's not Avon there either. Actually, um, very, I, I really like him in the Silurians, actually. Yeah, major, it's good. Major. He, good. he should have, He could have been a regular. He could have been. In fact, had he had he been that part one more season on, he would have stayed. Yeah, that's right. But, yeah, don't be the second, second commander of the Brigadier in the first season. You're dead every episode, every show. Yeah, yeah that's it. The play is called The Silver Sky, and it's a science fiction. It's a time travel uh, episode that was broadcast, as I said, in 1980 on the BBC, and uh, it is available on uh, a website that you can download and have a listen to, which I did. Uh, interesting concept of time, like we in, in Doctor Who, we're used to time travel, like it's a, it's a thing that you it's like a road that you travel up and down, and but in other shows have different concepts of time, like time slip is a different concept, Sapphire and Steel is a different concept. Uh, This one is a slightly different concept, again, about the reasons why you can or can't travel into the past or future and what it it actually means. It gets very philosophical towards the end. Uh, So, yeah, it's a very interesting uh, thing to listen to. If you like Paul Darrow, listen to it for that. If you like Blake Seven, Tanith Lee, listen to it for that. Uh, I will just recommend it. I'll put links to that in the show notes. Uh, We'll have a listen to that. It sounds fascinating. Well, thanks very much, Philip, for today's episode. It's been 
a pleasure as always. As and, always. Uh, looking forward to uh, to when we get together next month and do it all over again. Yep. And uh, until then, we'll catch you next time. See you, Dwayne. See you, everyone. This has been the Sirens of Audio, episode 109. We've got Randomoids featuring the stories Ish and the Guardians of Prophecy with our guests Jonathan Morris and your hosts Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. Theme music by Joe Kramer. Contact us or check out all our details at sirensofaudio.com. Send us some audio feedback via anchor.fm slash sirensofaudio or drop us a line at sirensofaudio at gmail.com. We love interacting with you. Thanks for listening, audiophiles. We'll catch you next time.